Oh, oh, my guess is there was no audio there. So hold on. Uh, I think you might be able to hear me now. Welcome back to another episode of Dome to Home, Perseverance to Mars. My name is Jeremy. I work at Fisk Planetarium as a navigator and a outreach presenter. Um, with us today, we have Dr. Laura Particulous and Dr. Robin Ramstad. Uh, they're our special guest speakers. They'll be talking to you guys today about the Martian atmosphere, the air on Mars. Uh, so with that, Laura, why don't you uh, tell us a bit, little bit about yourself? Okay, thank you, Jeremy. It's really great to be here with you all today. Uh, my name, as um, Jeremy said, is Laura Pedicolis, and I work at um, a university in California called Sonoma State University. If you um, know about San Francisco, it's north of San Francisco, and I've lived here for since 20. 2000, um, so almost so 20 years I've been here. And I worked at UC Berkeley for a while and I've studied my, my expertise in, in upper atmospheres and the Aurora Borealis, or you might know it as the Northern Lights, um, both on Earth and Mars. So I look forward to talking to you all today. And Robin, I think you're gonna introduce yourself next. Hello everyone and thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming. My name is Robin Ramstad. I'm a researcher at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I'm originally from Sweden, but you might detect a little bit of an accent there. Uh, I came from a, a background of doing a lot of Mars research, particularly the upper atmosphere and how the atmosphere is evolving. So that's what I'm looking at in the present day as well, uh, to try and figure out what made the planet turn from warm and wet to cold and dry as it is today. Thank you. Great, all right. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get into our show. Um, Laura, you wanna take it away? Sure. So I thought we would start um, with a little bit of uh, a little thinking or contemplating, questioning. So if we think about the air on earth, um, what is it that tells you that there is air on Earth? Like, how, how do you even know there's air on Earth? Um, if you have a response to that question, go ahead and put it in the chat window. And we have um, Tara, she's um, there watching you all, your chats, and she'll let us know what you have to say about that. Yeah, our, uh, our excellent question master behind the scenes. Yes, we're glad to have her there. Um, and as you're thinking about that and hopefully putting your, your answers in the chat, um, the other question I'd like you to contemplate is um, what might we look for on Mars as evidence for air? Um, how would we know if there's air on Mars by looking at it from far away? And so you, Jeremy, you might've heard said both the word air and the word atmosphere. And we use those words interchangeably, but there is a subtle difference in their meaning. And um, what I'm wondering if you might know what, what those subtle differences are and why, why is it in science that we use the word atmosphere? But when you're talking to your friends, you might say the air is, murk um, the air is um, maybe foggy or the air is uh, filled with smoke. I know some of you there in Colorado maybe have smoky skies, and I hope none of you are being influenced or affected by that um, fire right now. So if you have, um, that's another thing we have in common <laughs> so here in California. We also just dealt with that, such a big fire. And we had a lot of smoke in our air, is how I would say it to my friends. Um, as a scientist, I might say the atmospheric conditions changed during the fire. So you see there's a little bit of a subtle difference there. Okay, so to answer these questions, we're first going to explore, we've, I've already mentioned um, what you might think of on Earth and what you might think of on Mars. So we're going to look a little bit more uh, we're going to look more in that, we're going to compare Earth and Mars um, some more, and we're going to start back with a question that some of you might have already um, heard a little bit about on another Dome to Home show about water on Mars. 
Um, so I think some of you know that uh, there used to be, well, we think, scientists think that there may have been um, water on Mars. It's still not um, confirmed because we can't, we don't have a time machine. We can't get in some time machine and go back in time <laughs> and, and see Mars. But we're, as scientists, we look for evidence and we make claims about that evidence. So if, you're, if you look now at this beautiful um, globe that Jeremy's put up for us, then you can see what uh, kind of a cartoon or a rendition of what we think Mars might have looked like um, a long, long time ago. And today we're going to talk about uh, what, what happened, um, what might have happened to, to that water and where did it go? And... So let's go ahead and look at what Mars looks like today. Because if we look at Mars today, you'll notice that um, there's no blue. So what was the blue on the other image? I'm sure that um, most of you know that that was representing the water or big oceans on Mars. And here today, there is no blue. <laughs> there's, there's no liquid water um, that we found. Although if you heard the last Dome to Home show about water, you will know that there is solid water. And what do we call solid water? Ice. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So um, water can come in three different phases. It's ice, and then if we warm up ice, then it becomes water. And if we warm up water, if you are boiling water on a stove, what happens to some of that water? If you leave that water on a stove for a long time boiling, I don't know if any of you have come back and found, oops, all the water's gone. <laughs> Me, but every time I make mac and cheese, because I get lazy and I start walking away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yes, I've done the same thing. So it's not that the water disappeared because matter doesn't disappear, matter changes. So that's one of the rules in physics is the, it's called conservation of matter. So matter never disappears, but it, it can change from one form to another form. And so ice can change to a liquid, liquid water, and liquid water can turn to a gas. So what's happening to that water is it's disappearing into the gas, the air, that we um, live in and breathe. So on Mars, um, most of the water is frozen. And um, we also have a different kind of ice on Mars, which will be important when we talk, when Robin talks more about the atmosphere. Um, and that's called carbon dioxide ice, CO2 ice, which um, also you might know as dry ice. So, We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so what happened to, um, well, what happened to this water that we think might've been in Mars and how do we, how, what evidence do we have that that water really was there? So let's take some picture, let's take some look at some stream channels and deltas. Yeah, so I just wanna highlight kind of what the surface of Mars looks like currently, some of these pictures um, are pictures that have been taken by rovers on Mars. Um, and so you can see how it's really dried up. Um, just to kind of reiterate that point that Laura was making, that there's no water, but we see um, some features even by just looking at the rocks. And then also, if we go back to our dome view here, and we take a look at some of these features Laura was talking about. There we go. Wonderful. So one of these pictures uh, is an image of Mars, and the other is actually an image of Earth. Yeah, so in the chat, why don't you um, why don't you guess which which image is on Mars and which <coughs> image is on Earth? <clears throat> if you're if you're joining us via chat. Okay, so it turns out that the top one is from Earth, and that is a that shows river and stream channels in Yemen, which is a country far away from here. 
Um, it's a desert region in the Middle East. The light gray features are channels that start out as small streams and flow into larger and larger rivers. Yemen only gets a little bit of rain, but still water is an important, plays an important role in shaping this landscape. So that, that you can see that's, it's a, basically a desert on earth. And then on the bottom image that you can see there, that is a Viking One Orbiter image from 1976, and it shows channels on Mars. The biggest channel is 350 kilometers. So some of you might not know kilometers. Those are the, the unit of measure we use in science. Um, but, but most of you have probably driven um, many miles to visit relatives or friends. So if you want to know how long that is, it's about 215 miles long. And we think that it was probably carved by water flowing over the surface of Mars. Okay, let's look at some, some more features here. All right, again, we have a Earth image and a Mars image here. So one of them is from Earth and one's from Mars. In the chat, go ahead and, and put which one you think is from which. Okay, so the, um, the one on the right is the Earth image. Then the one on the left is from Mars. The one on the right is an image of the Yukon Delta in Alaska. And the squiggly light gray lines are river and stream channels bringing water and sediment from the Yukon River to the Bering Sea. On the left, um, it's the Ebers Volta Delta on Mars and it's a fossil delta. So that just means that it doesn't have water there anymore. Um, and this delta is evidence that we have water, that water did used to be on Mars for a long period of time, in fact. Okay, so let's... Yeah, so we have those kind of comparison images. Thing here. And then... So why does Earth have water? And Mars doesn't, what happened to it? Here you can see there's, there's a, a lot of evidence for water um, and erosion, which essentially is the carving of the landscape by water. So you can think of um, the water is just flowing and it's moving rocks as it flows. You've probably seen that in rivers um, and creeks that you've visited. So you can see all these features here on Mars. There's a lot of evidence for th this type of um, this, this, that these feet, that water flowed. And here you see, we're kind of showing, how we've made a planet that's half Earth and half Mars. <laughs> so here you can see um, Earth, what, you, what do you notice here? You might notice um, that Mars has less atmosphere and fewer clouds. Mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, there's more gravity on Earth. It's a bigger planet, more massive planet. Um, Mars is colder and farther from the sun than Earth. And Mars doesn't have any more uh, volcanic activity. It used to have volcanic activity, we think, but it doesn't anymore, whereas Earth does. So all of these things play into um, our ideas of the atmosphere. So let's, let's think a little bit more about atmospheric what happens um, to the water over time. Um, so if we think about a planet and wonder, we could think about the ground and then the atmosphere and space. So um, one of the reasons we use the word atmosphere also is because an atmosphere represents a system of, of interactions. And so in the chat, if you could put where where do you think that water on Mars might have gone? Okay, so when we think of this question as scientists, we think, and Jeremy, maybe we can go to the next, um, next graphic there, because we, we think of sources and losses, meaning where, where, 
what is, if we're thinking about the atmosphere, we want to think about what goes into the atmosphere and what leaves the atmosphere. So what is a source for the atmosphere might be then, or and a loss for the atmosphere. So a simple way to say this is what might have gone down? <laughs> did the water go down or did the water go up? And um, so this diagram is kind of just showing you that the water, some of the water went down into the crust, into the ground, and some of the water went into the atmosphere, but some of the water then went into space, we think. Some of the atmosphere went into space. And, um, but does space provide any atmosphere? So Robin will talk more about that. Okay, let's go to the next slide, next view. Okay, so this just gives you a, um, a closer up that that water and air are connected. Um, and um, that essentially what happens on, on the planet influences the atmosphere and what happens in space influences the atmosphere. Right, okay. so there we go. I think, uh, thanks for that, Laura. Um, I think now we're gonna be switching over to Robin, I wanna say, is that correct? Yes. All righty. Right. Yeah, I really like the answers that are coming up in chat here. It's all about the magnetic sphere, right? It's uh, going underground into the ice caps. Yes, those are all valid possibilities. You can think of the atmosphere as this shell between the, the planet itself and all the reservoirs of water that you have in the ice caps and the uh, outer space. So from the atmosphere's view being a shell, the uh, atmosphere or the water in it can either go down or it can go up. So uh, to understand the uh, evolution of the atmosphere, you have to constrain, you have to understand both of those processes. Can it go up, can it go, would it go up, would it go down? And that's part of uh, the uh, mission that we're doing, uh, the science that we're doing with uh, another spacecraft called MAVEN. Uh, let's see where we're going. So, yes, uh, we're touching on a concept that uh, Laura was already mentioning that gases can transition from, or matter can transition from different phases, from liquid to solid to gas and so on. And I think here we have an example coming up. Yes, this is, uh, uh, I believe it's CO2, CO2 ice. So it's a solid, it's carbon dioxide that you normally find in the atmosphere. It's a pretty small part of the atmosphere on the Earth. It's the, ma the major component of the atmosphere on Mars. And you, as you can see it, uh, if you have a solid block of ice in a bucket like this, it transitions directly into a gas, a very cold gas. And that condenses the water in the atmosphere as well, creating this little cloud around that cold CO2 air. And so this is uh, the CO2 gas. It's the major co co constituent of the Martian atmosphere. The atmosphere, the air in it, can, it consists of a lot of different kind of molecules. From night here on the Earth, we have a lot of nitrogen. To, in the background here, you see as little ends that are connected by three bonds. And you have carbon dioxide, which is the C with the two O's next to it. And uh, you have, I think, even a water molecule there. It's an oxygen, an O, connected by two H. So it looks like a little Mickey Mouse upside down. And all of these, they're like this big mix. Uh, the area around us, it's a big mix of all of these components, and all of them behave differently, even though they're part of the same air. See, what we have, solar winds are blowing. CMEs can blow it right off if you don't have enough storm magnetosphere. Yeah, that's, uh, we're going into that. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, would you push us along? Yeah, so we'll go ahead and switch over to our Maven view here. And I'll let Robin take it from there. He knows much more than I do. Yes, here we have an image of the Maven spacecraft. It's this uh, spacecraft that was 
uh, built and uh, launched by NASA. It's operated here from the University of Colorado at the Laboratory of Atmospheric and Space Physics where I work. And um, we're using the MAVEN spacecraft to uh, measure the atmosphere itself. And we're measuring the amount of atmosphere that's flowing out uh, from the planet due to the interaction with the solar wind. Uh, let's see what we have coming up. That's uh, it's a little hard for me to see. <laughs> so yeah, so we'll go ahead as Robin uh, stated kind of what uh, the MAVEN spacecraft is. Uh, one of the main things that MAVEN does is it studies the magnetic fields. And I think that's what we're seeing here. That's uh, the magnetic field vectors laid out on the sphere that represents the planet itself. And you see that the uh, uh, magnetic field vectors, they are a bit patchy on the surface of the planet. They're, the arrows uh, show the direction where it's pointing at. It's going a little bit here and there, here and there. Uh, it's a little bit of a cluster uh, rather than what you have find on Earth. Uh, Earth has this really nice, big, strong dipole that's very, well, very well organized. Uh, whereas Mars has all these little patchy areas of magnetic field. And we think that that's, that doesn't really protect the atmosphere very well from a stream of uh, gas plasma uh, that's coming from the sun called the solar wind. Maybe now would be a good time to show that um, iron filings. Yeah, so just in case anyone is unfamiliar with magnetic fields and kind of what they are, what they do, uh, when we're talking about magnetic fields, maybe some of you are familiar with this kind of image where you have a bar magnet and if you throw down a, uh, a bunch of iron filings kind of on a table next to that bar, but that magnet, they will align with the magnetic fields um, that are generated from that bar magnet. So the earth is like one big giant bar magnet. And you could think you have kind of this bar oriented through the poles. And so it's generating this magnetic field that goes up through the North pole and kind of down uh, circles around and then up, up through the South pole. And so that is one of the things that Maven does. Um, if we switch back to this dome view here, another thing that Maven does is study Aurora on Mars. So Robin, you want to talk a little bit about Aurora or maybe what they're seeing here in this image? Yeah, the green that you're seeing here, it's uh, a representation of uh, the Aurora that Maven sees. So uh, Maven has a special kind of camera that is really sensitive to see the kind of emissions given off by Aurora. And uh, on Mars, you see that the, it's the entire day side of the planet that's glowing here uh, in the upper panels that's uh, showing, shown as sort of purple pinkish color. Uh, and in the lower panel, it's, uh, it's projected onto the sphere and shown as a green. And uh, that or the aurora, it represents uh, the interaction between the uh, atmosphere and the upstream solar wind. And we think that the, uh, the forces that are involved in creating Aurora are also uh, re representative of the forces that create the outflow of atmosphere from the planet. So by studying uh, things, uh, phenomena like the Aurora, we are understanding how the atmosphere is escaping from the planet and how it's, the atmosphere is evolving over time. Right, so here I'll show a video of what Maven studies and what uh, is shown in my background right here uh, and what Robin was just talking about, uh, how um, this atmosphere is being pulled and stripped away from, uh, from Mars. Yeah, this is showing the uh, planet itself is not <coughs> magnetized. So but it creates a bit of an induced magnetosphere that deflects the solar wind that you see coming from the left and it forces it around the planet. But the particles from the atmosphere itself that you're seeing as bright colors, uh, the color represents the velocity of the particles. It's flowing out, they're getting pulled out into the solar wind and then uh, accelerated to very, very high energies and carried away into space. Uh, the, the forces that are involved in that are a bit complicated and they generate this kind of mohawk-like shape coming out of the 
forehead of the planet, if you will. <laughs> and that's uh, in the background here, you see an overlay that is the, uh, the fluxes that Maven measure. The, it's actually measuring each particle coming out of the atmosphere. And the red colors, they show very high fluxes um, and blue colors show low fluxes. So you see that's really behind the planets and somewhat above it, it's where you have the strongest fluxes. Let's see what we have in, in chat. You, uh, do you think Mars could be inhabitable in the future? Well, the thing is it keeps losing atmosphere, right? And it needs more atmosphere to be habitable. So it, it, it looks like it's getting less and less habitable every time, if that makes sense. <laughs> Even now it's not habitable, but it's not getting better. And this is showing you uh, an idea of how that uh, might look in a schematic kind of way. The, at the atmosphere gets pulled off and uh, patches, those blue patches that you saw coming off due to the energy that it gets from the solar wind. Great, so that's a little bit about uh, what MAVEN is studying. And we'll have, we have a couple other kind of uh, projected maps here that we can show you um, dealing with magnetic fields. So this first one that we'll start off with here is if uh, you were to take the magnetic field that I was talking about here on Earth, you know, coming through the South Pole, going up through the North Pole. And if I spin us around here a little bit, Oops, you might be able to see that a little bit better now that we're upside down. There we go. Oh, so if we look here, you can see those green arrows that are all pointing kind of in one, uh, one direction here. Sorry, I'm floating us through space, spinning all over the place now. Uh, but the point here, so if I get away from this little label here, you can see that they're all <clears throat> relatively the same strength, more or less, and they're all pointing in the same direction. So now if we took uh, this same method of making a plot of the uh, magnetic field on Mars and took a look at that map, you don't see nearly as many arrows, if any. I might, maybe if we could zoom in way close, you can maybe pick out, if you go full screen and stare really, really closely to your computer, <laughs> which I don't always recommend, but you might be able to see that there is actually, those arrows are still there. They're a very faint yellow color, which was the lower end of that, uh, that color bar that we used. Um, and so what this is showing is that the magnetic field is much, much weaker on Mars. Um, and if you could see those little directions, it would look something uh, more similar to this. Let me pull up uh, this image here for you guys. <clears throat> and this is similar kind of to that magnetic field that we were talking about on Mars. So this is like the localized patches of the crust on Mars that are uh, have that are magnetically charged. Robin, anything you would like to add to that? Did I miss anything? I would like to answer a really good question. I see yeah. In chat. Uh, yeah. Brianna is asking, what colors are the aurora on Mars? Well, that's uh, what colors are the aurora on Earth? In, on the Earth, if you look up, I actually lived in the polar regions for a while where you have the strong aurora overhead. And if you go out on different nights, sometimes you see the aurora as being green, sometimes you see the aurora as being red, sometimes you see a combination of green light and red light and blue light. And those colors, they correspond to the uh, constituents in the atmosphere, these different particles, these different molecules or atoms. So uh, green and red, that's created by oxygen, depending on how uh, the solar wind is interacting with, how much energy it gets from the solar wind. And um, blue is from nitrogen. So the uh, aurora, also the color of the aurora tells you what particles you have in the atmosphere. And on Mars, actually the uh, aurora that we're detecting with MAVEN, it's uh, ultraviolet. It's uh, in a part of the visible range that we can't see. But there's, that's uh, emission from carbon dioxide. 
but there's also um, it should also be creating light in uh, uh, the same colors as it does on Earth because there's free oxygen available. So there should be some green color as well. But we have actually never placed the same way we have on the Earth. We don't have never placed a sensitive enough camera on the surface on the night side to take photos of the aurora. So uh, we actually don't really have any good visible picture of aurora on the night side. All, we have these uh, nice, beautiful uh, pictures of the aurora in the ultraviolet, but there's no picture of the visible aurora, at least not yet. I'll have to wait for future missions. Excellent. Um, so let's go ahead and maybe just start answering some questions. Um, as we wait for some questions to start coming in, uh, I had a question for you two, because this is something that I've been wondering about a long time, and I kind of heard rumors of it, and I'm kind of confused. But So we're talking about how Mars is losing its atmosphere to space um, and how that's related to a magnetic field. So since Earth does have a magnetic field, do we not lose any atmosphere? Is our atmosphere condensed and stuck on the planet? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll start with that question. Um, there are two ways we lose atmosphere to space. Um, one is through a, a very small um, region of our magnetic shield that is called the cusp. And it's a small area where we lose, we actually lose um, particles. <coughs> So it's just like, it's, it's open, it's the one place that our atmosphere is open to the, these solar wind particles that we keep talking about and interacting with um, the Martian atmosphere. And those particles actually can make it all the way down to a little area of the aurora called cusp. And then it energizes those, that region, just like we're seeing here in this beautiful animation. Um, and then in that area, it energizes our atmosphere and essentially pulls it out through that funnel, that cusp area. So we, that atmosphere that then gets pulled out through that cusp gets, um, disappears and we never see it again. However, we also have um, atmosphere that goes into space and it it gets caught in what I like to call the jailhouse of the sky, which is what, or the magnetosphere <laughs> um, in uh, our professional speak. Um, the magnetosphere essentially traps those particles uh, within it. And some of those oxygen, um, they're called ions because they lose an electron. But those, those charged particles, some of those part, part of the, our atmosphere goes out into the um, magnetosphere. And then uh, some of those will actually come back to our atmosphere um, at a later time. So there's kind of this um, flow, kind of a breathing of, of atmosphere that goes out and back in um, because of our magnetosphere. So Robin, I don't know if you wanna to add to that. Yeah, I think it's uh, quite an active field of research, just how much, uh, because particles, they tend to stick to the magnetic fields, that the magnetic field lines that they are on. So if a particle gets pulled out into the magnetosphere, it'll, get, it'll keep staying stuck on that field line, and the field line will carry it back into the atmosphere. And uh, we're, people are really trying to understand both the Martians and Earthlings, if you will, Earthling scientists and Martian scientists are trying to understand these different escape processes on the, uh, the two planets and compare them. Um, so, but people think that the, um, part of the escaping particles coming uh, from the Earth, that they are stuck on those field lines and they just get returned back. Whereas on, the Mar on Mars, you have uh, well, no very weak magnetic fields of those uh, particles that can easily leave the field lines and flow out into space. So the, um, uh, so the, the sort of the magnetosphere provides a recycling, if you will, of the atmosphere that flows out, make, making it come back that Mars doesn't mm. have. But uh, that's why it's an, in, it's an exciting and interesting part of science that we're, we don't really know for sure. And that's what we're trying to find out, what is, the importance of magnetic fields in uh, protecting the atmosphere. Interesting, okay. 
Um, let's see what other questions we have. Uh, it looks like we have one in the chat from, let's see here. I'm not seeing a name here, but it said, did Earth's theoretical collision with Thea create our unusually high magnetic field, AKA larger than normal iron core? I think we need the geologist here. <laughs> <laughs> Should I jump in? Can you hear me? Yeah, so our, our question master <laughs> behind the scenes, Tara, I, I knew she was gonna be coming in uh, handy for this show. Uh, she'll, she'll help us out with this one. Take it Happy away, Tara. To help. I thought about typing it all into the chat, but it's a lot to put into one little message. So um, generally the short answer is that our magnetic field is mostly generated by interactions between that solid iron core and all of the liquid that surrounds it in what we call the mantle. That's the, the magma and the lava that always comes out when you have volcanic eruptions. So it's the interaction of those two that generates that magnetic field. It's what we call a dynamo. So if we didn't have either that solid core or the molten outer core, then we wouldn't have a magnetic field. And that's one of the things that goes into Mars's loss of its magnetic field is that it's much, much smaller than the Earth. And so it's never, it got a lot cooler, a lot faster. So it doesn't have that liquid inside to interact with its solid core if that makes sense. So that's one of the reasons that we think that it might have lost most of that magnetic field or why it doesn't have a really big, robust one like we have. Hey, you guys can see my kitchen. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. We're not sure if it has anything to do with the collision itself, but if it's liquid inside, then we can generate that field. Great, thanks, Tara. Great, oh. thanks, Tara. And I wanted to point out um, that what you just saw where we pulled in a scientist who has that expertise, <laughs> um, once, you, once you start focusing on a particular research topic, um, we become pretty narrowly focused on our content knowledge. So we have to pull in our, our friends and colleagues for such questions. And I see we do have a, a large CME and solar flare question in there. Um, do you fear large CMEs and solar flare direct hits? One could bring down the power grid. What about the other effects? Um, how much atmosphere gets blown off each time? Um, so I, on, on Earth, um, the magnetos, yes, uh, there are power grid issues when you have, um, so, so CMEs stand for coronal mass ejections. Um, those are large uh, ejections of uh, matter from our sun that get carried through our solar system um, in, and they impact uh, planets. And we study, Rob and I study how, how those impact planets, atmospheres. Um, and that you can think of it as an energy conservation or energy, there's a lot of energy with the coronal mass ejections. Um, and, and ma matter and mass momentum. And anyways, that can really impact the magnetosphere, this um, big magnetic bubble around earth, which then creates electrical currents to flow very much like a generator does uh, to create the, the current that goes through your house and powers all your equipment. So when the CMEs can hit the earth's magnetosphere, you can generate tons of electricity through the, um, space systems and those actually get induced into ground currents and can indeed shut off um, power grids. But in terms of lo loss of atmosphere, just like Robin was saying, that's a, still a huge uh, research topic that we're, we're involved in um, as part of a, a NASA center called the uh, Mach Center, um, where we are trying to understand the loss of atmosphere due to these big CMEs and flare events. So we don't know yet, but maybe in a couple years. And maybe you could talk about Mars, CME effects on Mars, Robin. Yeah, we've, we've studied them, but um, the problem with during CMEs and this kind of space weather, as it's called, when you have sun being very active and blowing out big storms, uh, it's a bit of a problem now. Maven, Maven, Maven is very good. It's extremely well equipped to measure the atmospheric escape due to these kind of events. The problem is that we're right now at a phase called solar minimum where the solar activity is very, very low. It's even historically low. 
uh, meaning that the sun doesn't produce many of these storms, meaning that we don't really get a lot of chances to study them. We've only had maybe a couple in the last five years or so. But the ones that we looked at, it seems that there is, uh, when we get an event, we get a lot more acceleration in the particles that are coming out of the atmosphere. And uh, they're, uh, depending on where you look, there's more in some regions. It seems to be about the same in others. And it's a really complicated response. And you only get a single point of measurements because the spacecraft is only measuring in a single point. Um, so it's, uh, it's complicated and we're working on it. And we're really looking forward to the next solar maximum uh, coming up in the next couple of years when there will be more aurora on the earth, more aurora on Mars, more particles flowing out, more exciting events like CMEs. Um, so, and our, our centers, uh, I think everybody involved in our uh, science center is uh, very excited about the upcoming solar maximum. Definitely. Well, I think uh, we're just about out of time for you guys. Unfortunately, we never have enough time for these shows. Um, but what we just want to say thank you to our uh, special guests today, Dr. Uh, Laura Particulus and uh, Dr. Robin Romstad. Uh, we really appreciate having you guys on here uh, at Fist Planetarium. Um, until next week, guys, we'll be coming back and we'll be learning about uh, Martian seasons and climate. So if you want to do a, a deep dive into that, uh, join us next week, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Um, make sure to like, share, and subscribe this page or this video if you enjoyed it. Tell your friends about us because we do it all for you guys, um, and you're what makes it makes it possible. So uh, until that, anything else you guys want to add, Laura or Robin? Um, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Yep, thank you very much. All right. Great questions. Thanks, everybody. Take care.